over to the pale tokos, and to receive with his hands how to do the much more the supplications of a mother able to find a master to the kind heartedness. Despise not the prayers of sinners, O pure one, for he who condescended to suffer for us is merciful and strong to save. Let your tender mercies quickly go before us, for we have become exceedingly poor. Help us, O God, our Savior, for thy sake, for the glory of your name. The Lord, deliver us and cleanse us from our sins, for your name's sake. Holy God, who might you one more time mercy on us? Holy God, who might you one more time mercy on us? Holy God, who might you one more time mercy on us? Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. The most holy Trinity, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our transgressions. Holy and long presented in the activities for your name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Glory the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Of all men, 
through the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of
The God of mercy is a father who loves his children. Seeing humility and your truth, penitence, my child, receives you as you receive the prodigal son, you who wholeheartedly entreat him and confide yourself to him. Why have you come here, sister, falling down before the holy altar and before this holy assembly? At the sign of the light of the senses. Do you desire to be deserving of the angelic habit and to be ranked in the choir with other monastics? Yes, with God's help, Father. You do today, truly, you have chosen a good and blessed word, but only if you live it to the very end. For good works are wrought in labor and achieved with pain. Look at the ears of your heart, my sister. And attend to the voice of the Lord, saying, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your soul. So now give to God the right answer to each of these questions with fear and joy. Know that our Savior, together with his all praiseworthy mother, all the holy angels, and all his saints, he is himself present here, inspiring the words that you speak, so that when he comes to judge the quick and the dead, you may repay, he may repay you, not according to what you are about to agree to and confess, but according to what you will have kept of what you are about to confess. Therefore, if at this hour you come to God in truth, give careful and thoughtful answers to the questions we are about to ask you. Do you of your own free will and mind come to the Lord? Not with any necessity or constraint. Do you renounce the world and all that is in the world according to the command of God? Do you abide in this monastery or in the one that you may be indicted to you in holy obedience and in holy abstinence until your last breath? Will you keep yourself in chastity, soberness, and piety until death? For you until the day of your death be obedient to the superior of all the sisterhood in Christ. Will you, for the love of Christ, keep until death the community's rule of voluntary renouncing all personal possessions and accepting want? And are you prepared neither to acquire nor to withhold anything for yourself except by an act of obedience for the common good? and not for your own will. Do you accept all the rules of the common monastic life and its regulations established by the Holy Fathers and embodied for you by the abbots? Do you endure all the difficulties and sorrows that the monastic life will bring with it for the sake of the kingdom of heaven? Behold, my child, what nature of promises you are giving to our Savior, Christ. Angels are invisibly present recording your profession, for which you will be held accountable at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I will advise you on this most perfect life, which, you ex which exemplifies by similarity our Lord's way of life. I will teach you what things you ought to embrace and what things you must avoid. For you have chosen my child to come to the Lord and to serve him. If, therefore, you will to become a monastic, above all, cleanse yourself from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Acquire humility 
with which you shall become an inheritor of the good things of eternity. Lay aside the boldness of worldly behavior. Be obedient to all. Be uncomplaining in the services which of you by be steadfast in prayer. Do not be slothful in vigils. Do not be discouraged in temptations. Do not be lax in fasting. But know that through prayer and fasting you must cause God to be merciful. Do not be discouraged in your weakness. Guard against evil thoughts. For the enemy will never stop reminding you of your life in the world and causing you to dislike virtuous conduct. You have made a beginning in the way that leads you to the kingdom of heaven. You must therefore not look back at these things of which you have left behind, for you will not be fit for the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, nothing may come before God. Love not your father, nor your mother, nor your brother, nor any one of your own kindred, and love not yourself more than God, nor the kingdoms of this world, nor any sort of com comfort and honor. Turn not away from poverty, nor hardship, nor human contempt, nor from anything you consider to be difficult, lest you be hindered from coming after Christ. But be sober in all things, ever seeking those good things which belong to those who have lived with hope in God, doing his will. Always remember the martyrs and all the saints who from the beginning suffered many pains and labors and numberless agonizing deaths, and who through these were victorious. Above always, always have before the eyes of your spirit the saving passion and life-giving death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Endure all hardships as a good soldier of Christ, who being rich in mercy became poor for our sakes, coming among us that we might share the riches of his kingdom. We must imitate him and endure all things for him, perfecting ourselves in his presence by day and by night. For the Lord himself has said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And this means that he is to be ever ready until death to fulfill Christ's commandments in all things. For you have to endure hunger and thirst, to be naked, insulted and mocked, to suffer reproach and persecution, and to be afflicted in many other painful ways. By all these things, that life in God is manifested. <coughs> when you do suffer all these things, he said, Rejoice, for great is your reward in heaven. For Christ Jesus our God, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you conf thus confess all these things in hope and the power of God? And do you agree to hold fast these promises to the end of your life by the grace of Christ? The all compassion and mercy of God who said, A woman shall forget the fruit of her womb before ever I shall forget you. It opens up the pure affection of his unsearchable goodness to everyone who comes to him with desire and fervent prayer. He also knows your desire, and to, and to your good purpose he lends his own strength for the fulfillment of his commandments. May he receive, embrace, and shield you. May he be to you a strong fortress in the face of the enemy, a rock of endurance, a source of consolation, inspiring courage, providing peace of soul, encouraging you to be you in all hardships, present with you when you lie down and when you rise up, comforting and cheering your heart through the consolation of his own Holy Spirit, and deeming you worthy of the lot of the holy protomartyrs Thecla, Eucroxia, Olympias, and their companions, with whom you also shall inherit the kingdom of heaven in Christ Jesus our Lord and to whom be glory, might, and dominion, and power with the Father and the Holy Spirit, 
now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord our God, who has decreed that those who are worthy of you have partaken the world of possessions, family, and friends, and have followed you, receive now your handmaiden, Sister Mary, who has given up all these things according to your holy commandments, and guide her in the way of your truth, for she prostrates herself before you without wavering. Fortify her with the strength of your Holy Spirit, so that no hostile trick may be able to prevail against her, and grant her patience that she may ever be pleasing to you. Through the intercessions of your most holy lady, the birth giver of God, and of all the saints, who from the beginning were both pleasing to you. For blessed and glorified is your honorable and majestic name, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Peace be unto all. And to your spirit. Let us bow our heads unto the Lord. Lord of God, the hope and refuge of all who have put their trust in you, who have revealed to us the various to pass the salvation through the incarnation of your Christ. Receive your handmaid Mary, who has forsaken worldly delights and has offered herself to you, O Lord, as a living, acceptable sacrifice. Take away from her all carnal desire and irrational thoughts, so that along with the removal of her senseless hairs, she may lay aside her senseless designs and actions, and may be accounted worthy to take up your easy yoke and your light burden, and to take up the cross and follow you, her Lord. Preserve her in your holiness, and give her the good intention of keeping your holy commandments. Number her in due season in the coming of the company of your elect, through the grace and compassion and love for mankind, for your only begotten Son, with whom you are blessed, Together with your all holy, good, and life creating spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of creation. Amen. Behold, Christ is present invisibly. See that no one is compelling you to come to this order. See that you come of your own will to the betrothal of the great and angelic image. Take the scissors and give them to me. Take the scissors and give them to me. Take the scissors and give them to me. Behold, you receive them from the hand of Christ. See to whom you approach, to whom you promise, and to whom you renounce. Blessed is God who gives that all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. For blessed is he to the ages of ages. Sister Angelina. The shorn of the hair of her head is a sign of her renunciation of the world and all that is of the world, renouncing his self will and all of the desires of the flesh. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us all say for her, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
which will turn our eyes away from all vanity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us all say for her, Lord, have mercy. Sister, the shield of 
through faith, the cross of Christ by which all times he will resist the assaults of the evil one. Remember all the times the words of the Lord, that him who would come after me deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us all say to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Receive, sister, this candle, and take thee, so that from this day on you will be as a light in the world, through the example of your pure life and virtue. For the Lord himself said, let the light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our sister has received the betrothal of the great and angelic image and is clothed with all the armor of God so that she may defeat utterly the armies of the principalities and powers of the whole world who lead rulers in this present darkness and of the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Lord our God, receive now your servant among your spiritual land. Reunite her to your holy pool, purify her of her ungenerous impulses, and grant that she may never lose sight of the good things you have prepared for those who love you and who have crucified themselves in this life for the love of your kingdom. For you are the shepherd and the seeker after our souls, and to you belongs glory, and to you we offer glory to the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to ages of ages. Let us be aware, O brothers, of this great mystery. The Father in his great goodness runs out to meet his prodigal son as he returns from sin to his father's room. Kissing him, he confers once more upon him the signs of his glory and prepares a feast for the heavenly hosts, killing the fatted calf so that we also may live worthily of the sacrifice and father, the lover of mankind, and worthily also of the glorious victim, the savior of our souls. For you are merciful, O God, and a lover of mankind, and we offer glory to you, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Sister, what name do we call you? Let's pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the stability of the holy churches of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Yes, sir. 
for sins, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For our deliverance and ours from all danger, affliction, anger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help us, save us, have mercy upon us, and keep us, O God, by thy grace.
which contained a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, and the two tablets of the covenant, and above it the two cherubim of glory overshadowing the ark's lid. Of these things we cannot now speak in particular. <clears throat> now these things having been thus prepared, the priests go in continually into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the divine services, but into the second, the high priest enters alone once in the year, not without blood. <coughs> which, <coughs> which he offers for himself and for the ignorance of the people. Brethren, <coughs> be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we are not contending against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the equipment of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with you, with which you can quench all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Peace be unto you who read. And to your spirit, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hearken, O daughter, and see and find thine ear. So worthy of 
me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is Sodom and Gomorrah. 
And Abraham said to God, How can you do such a thing? Will you destroy that city if there are 50 righteous people? Oh, no, I will not. That's it. What if 10 are lacking? What if there are only 40 righteous people in that city? Will you destroy that city so that the righteous perish with the unrighteous? I should not do such a thing, says God. 30, 20. They have now understands that he's kind of pushing it a little bit. He says, forgive me, maybe this is a little bit too much. What if there are only 10 righteous people in that city? Will you perish them together with the unrighteous? And God says, no, I will not. If you read the rabbis, which early Christians did read very piously, the rabbis are saying, you see, you need at least 10 men as a quorum for any important service in the Jewish tradition. But if you read the fathers of the desert, they're saying, you see, we are the ten righteous people living in the deserts, and because of this, God is not destroying this world. That's what we're doing for you. And this is what you've been called to do today. You may be leaving the world, but you're not leaving the church. And we count on you, all of you mothers here in Dublin City, and everywhere where there are monastics, we count on you to pray for us, to pray for the world, to inspire us as we live our Christian life. Later on, good monastic tradition worked for the world. In the East, the one who wrote the most comprehensive rules of monasticism, St. Basil the Great, two sets of rules, he's also the one who had the charitable complex, the basiliades, these are orphanages, houses for the poor, young women who were in the streets were saved and brought in to learn about the faith, to learn a trade. Some of them got married. And this was how monastics <coughs> saw themselves as serving the world. Later on, monastics gave us the church, my favorite saint, Maximus the Confessor. And I loved him one of the reasons being that he was just a simple monk, never working. And yet, he kept us in check and when patriarchs and bishops and synods and emperors departed from the true faith, he stood strong. And an 82-year-old man ended up with his right hand cut off, his tongue cut off, so that he wouldn't write, he wouldn't speak. And only death stopped him from speaking the truth. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that every time you have a different opinion from a bishop, you're supposed to speak. Unfortunately, this <coughs> complex of the Maximus the Confessor is sometimes a little bit too prevalent among all Christians. Not all of us are St. Maximus the Confessor, let's admit it. If you ever doubt it, just go ahead and read it. If you think you can understand it, then read it in Greek. That's a very humbly thought, no matter how much Greek you know. So, we are very grateful. We, the Church, the Body of Christ. We are very grateful for those of you who defended icons, when our emperors were taking you out of monasteries and killing you and beating you and humiliating you for your faith. And we are very grateful how you stood up for the orthodox teaching of the uncreated energies. And some of us, we forgot about it. And many of you forgot about it as well. But no, there were always righteous people in monasteries. And so please know that when we come to Elwood City to witness a culture and monasticism, we come with great hopes that we marry people living in the world. We are going to find people who are praying for us, people who help those in need, people who stand for the truth. Also please know that we look at you as athletes. Many of us have children, and we drive them to soccer, to basketball, to baseball, to softball, and never once do we think, I should be like this athlete. But we come here and we are reminded that when St. Athanasius the Great wrote the life of St. Anthony, that is the founder of Egyptian monasticism, he called him an athlete in Christ. Now this expression, you well know, was actually used by St. Paul in regards to all Christians. These are not just monastics. 
all Christians. But many of us living in the world, we have forgotten about that. And sometimes we look on TV and we see professional football players, basketball players, whose bodies look just very, very, very strong. And then they speak in interviews about not eating any kind of bad food, of restricting their calorie intake, of sleeping right, of having their mind in the right place. And the type of pain and training that these modern athletes are doing is so exceptional, out of our reach. We would never think of doing such a thing. But when we see you fasting, prostrating, coming to services, sleeping less because you are praying, we're inspired. And we remind ourselves that yes, indeed, all of us are athletes for Christ. We also look at monasteries for leadership and guidance. So we come and we call you mothers, because we look at you as spiritual mothers. We come and we call you fathers, because we look at you as spiritual fathers. As a matter of fact, in our mind, those of us, I'm sorry for explaining us people, but we're members of the church, and I'm trying to tell you what we expect of you. <laughs> so, we're married people, and we know that there is absolutely no way that a married man, still being married, would ever become a bishop. And just instinctively, when we see monasticism, we say, those who are the leadership of our church. And that happens when we look at bishops, but it happens also when we look at the uh, spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. And so it was not surprising at all, though absolutely beautiful, to see how similar the right of the vesting of the new nun is to the right of ordination in which there is a prayer for each and every piece of vestment that you are receiving and you gird yourself with the faith in Christ so that then you can go and save others. Another thing that we expect, and I can say this because here at Elwood City you always do it, is that monastics are perpetuators of culture. You have transmitted culture throughout the centuries. Before the printing press, all the books that we're reading right now were copied by hand. And that's a great blessing because you monastics decided it's not just monastic literature that is worth keeping, but maybe also philosophical works or works of literature. And you kept on copying these and were very grateful. On the other hand, we find ourselves a little bit wanting for a spirituality of married life. We understand why you didn't copy that stuff, you didn't write that stuff, you were never concerned with that stuff. We understand that. Perfectly. But I come here at Elwood City and I only see so many families and children and people are very, very comfortable. And I would like to encourage you to continue that charism that monasticism has of transmitting all sorts of spirituality, not only the one that is directly relevant to you, but also the one that is relevant in the sense that that's your ministry towards those who need you. Now we come to the, this is a sermon is a little bit longer than a parish sermon, I apologize. <laughs> but we come now to the three vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. <laughs> this is what distinguishes today monastics from uh, other Christians. As a matter of fact, if you look clearly in the scriptures, you will see that Jesus says, if you wish to be perfect, you rich man, sell all your possessions and come and follow me. Some people have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, but this teaching is not for anyone. Whoever can take it, let them take it. So these three councils have been received later on in history as councils of Christian perfection. Meaning, if you want to be perfect, do these things. Chastity, poverty, obedience. But when we come and look at you living in these three vows, we are also reminded that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 548, in the Gospel of Matthew, be perfect, as your father, father is perfect. So we have this tendency to look at you sometimes as super Christians, but then we are reminded that we are supposed to do the same thing, just differently, just differently. So let's take poverty. Jesus tells a Jewish person, sell everything you have. This is crazy. How would you say such a thing according to human standards? Like today, Israel at that time was being persecuted by the Romans, was conquered. The last thing you want to do is to sell your possessions, which primarily means land. 
On the contrary, you want to grab more land. You want to have more possession because that's God's liberation of the nation of Israel. And Jesus is coming and saying, forget your idea of salvation, forget your idea of liberation, forget your idea of what is comfortable, forget your idea of what is good. Follow me. And so, early Christians, we read in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, had everything in common, just like you do. So I reminded that we are supposed to have things in common. And I don't think just zip card and renting other things, right? That's not only that. But what we are reminded of is that to follow Christ, we need to abandon our possessions, our idea of what is comfortable, and go and follow Him. Moreover, poverty became a significant trait of monasticism. If I may bring an ecumenical note here, because God finds holiness everywhere in the world, including in a small village in Italy, Assisi, there was a saint there, Francis by name, who was even regarded as the second Christ. Why? Many people thought, oh, it's because he received the stigmata, the marks of, the Jesus, of Jesus' crucifixion in his hands and in his feet. But no, Francis was the second Christ because of his marriage, mystical marriage, to Lady Poverty. He loved poverty. For him, poverty is not so much a burden to bear because you're a monastic, but rather it was the joy of living without a care in the world. So much did he love poverty that for his own monastic order, he decided that he would go a step further. You see, all monastics take the vow of poverty as individuals. But so much did he love poverty that he said, also monasteries have to be poor. Let me repeat that. So much did he love poverty that he said that also monasteries have to be poor. How? by giving everything they have to others, by opening their doors to others, by rejoicing in poverty. Chastity. As the second one, some have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven, says Jesus the Christ. And he's talking, when his disciples don't really understand how this whole marriage thing works, though many of them were married. So please understand, Jesus is talking to married people. Even in the Gospel reading that we heard today, did you see? You cannot love sons and daughters more than Christ. It's pretty clear that in his time there were two types of chastity. There were those who lived the life of chastity throughout their whole life, Jesus himself, and those who temporarily lived the life of chastity to follow Jesus and his mission, like Peter the Apostle. But we know that after they traveled to Jerusalem, they would come back to Capernaum, the place where Peter lived, and we have no reason to believe that Peter did not live in his house after he was called to follow Jesus. And so, as Christians living in the world, we are reminded of the importance of chastity, especially for our children who are not married yet in a world in which they need this type of testimony. Obedience. <coughs> Another vow that we have heard today that you took was obedience to the mother superior, to the rules of monasticism. I will add to that the obedience to bishops, of course, obedience to church structures. All of these represent Christ to us. And they represent Christ to us as the Christ who himself was obedient. In Philippians chapter 2, it says that God gave Jesus the name that is above every name. Why? Because he was obedient. Obedient even unto death. And so, it is not surprising that the hardest way to imitate Christ, many monastics say, is the vow of obedience. I myself contemplating becoming a monk at a certain point, and for a few weeks I actually stayed in the monastery and I thought of becoming a monk, then I realized obedience is not for me. <laughs> but then I got married, so... <laughs> But it started with an act of obedience of my wife, actually, because she took my last name. And she never interviewed me, what is your name, before she fell in love with me. And it is impressive to see that Mother Angelina was not consulted. 
What is her name? What a surprise when you said her name. <laughs> what an act of obedience. This is her first act of obedience. That she receives somebody else's name, the name that somebody else gives her, even though you are an adult with power of choice. But it is the first act of obedience. So all these examples are meant to show that we Christians living in the world, we look at you as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are members of the same body, members that function differently. Chastity, yes, we have to do that. Poverty, we have to do that. But in very different ways, all of us. And our body would not function, it would be limping if we didn't have a strong one or another member. So, indeed, Jesus is the bridegroom of the church. But now, if I may say in just very, very few words, why Jesus is also the bridegroom of the soul. This idea of Jesus as bridegroom is not new. As a matter of fact, it must have been very surprising to Jesus' audience when he called himself bridegroom. Remember, the bridegroom comes in the middle of the night. He was a single person. Everybody knew that. He had no wife. He had no children. And what they heard was a reference to the Old Testament in which God is the husband and Israel is the bride. So what Jesus is really telling them is that just like in the book Song of Songs, that never mentions the word God. It says love is divine, but never mentions the word God. In that whole book, it speaks about the love between a man and a woman actually representing the love that God has for Israel and the longing that Israel has for God. So when Jesus says that he's the bridegroom, everybody understands what he really means to say, that God the bridegroom has come to his bride, Israel. So without even blinking, the letter to the Ephesians can say that Christ is the bridegroom, he's the head, and then the church is the bride. But now, easily in monastic literature, the next step was taken to look at Jesus as the bridegroom of the soul. And sometimes when you read monastic literature, you are amazed to see how the same images from the book Song of Songs come and reoccur all over again. Because indeed, they see Jesus as the lover, as the bridegroom of the soul of the person who is now married to him. And so, yes, we've heard today that Jesus is the bridegroom of the church. And we do expect you to pray for us, to love us, to guide us, to help us. But also, Mother Angelina, today you got married to Jesus as the bridegroom of your soul. You know why he chose Israel? For no reason. He fell in love. Israel didn't do anything to deserve it. Israel does not earn to be God's people and then becomes God's people, but rather God, out of all the nations of the world, just falls in love and chooses Israel. You know why God chose us to be member, members of the church? Because he loved us. We haven't learned it. Most of us were baptized as babies. He loved us. And today, He chose your soul as His bride. You know why? Because He loves you. Love Him well, not in man. Sister Angelina. Mm -hmm. Let's say with all our soul, with all our minds, let us
him we pray for remission and forgiveness of the sins of the handmaid of God, Mother Angelina. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Again, we pray for our brethren, the priests, the hero monks, the hero deacons, and for all our brotherhood in Christ. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Again, we pray the Orthodox Patriarchs, the founders of this holy monastery, for all our fathers and brethren, the Orthodox of God, to rest before us, for the newly departed servants of God, the Archpriest Rotsko, Archpriest John Christopher, Evangelia, Ephrosini, Nicholas, Aaron, Theodore, Nicholas, Catherine, Diane, Daryl, Sally, Mary, Cora, Maria, Lynn, Nan Theodora, Sister Sarah, and for those who lie here and everywhere. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And we pray for mercy, life, peace, health, salvation, visitation, pardon and forgiveness of the sins of the servants of God. The Archpriest Andrew, the Archpriest John, Priest Anatoly, Archpriest David, Archpriest Stephen, Nun Agnes, Michelle, Alice, Francis, Ralph, Anna, the infant Catherine, Nancy, Helen, Stephen, Barbara, Christina, Stephanie, John, Kristen, Jamie, Paul, Jean, Mary, David, Nikki, Charles, Child, Carmela, Anka, Andrew, Juliana, and for the sisterhood of this holy monastery. Again, we pray for those who bear fruit and do good works in this holy and revered temple, for those who labor, for those who see, and for the people present who wait of the great and rich mercy. God, a merciful God, love us, man, and unto thee we send up glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Pray to the Lord, you catechumen. Lord, have mercy. Those who pray for the catechumens, that the Lord may have mercy on them. Lord, have mercy. That we teach them the word of truth. Wisdom that always being guarded under thy dominion. 
may give me this and the glory unto thee, to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages.
Justine Conn, Archbishop of Washington, Metropolitan of Old America and Canada, our Lord, the Most Reverend Nathaniel, Archbishop of Detroit, may the Lord God remember in his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. This God-protected and God-beloved land, its president, civil authorities, armed forces, and people, may the Lord God remember in his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. The founders, builders, benefactors, and sisterhood of this holy monastery, may the Lord God remember in his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. All those who are persecuted for the Orthodox faith, May the Lord God remember in his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Where mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters, and kinfolk will depart of this life before us, in the hope of resurrection to life eternal. May the Lord God remember in his kingdom always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. All of you Orthodox Christians, may the Lord God remember in his kingdom always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages.
who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became men. And he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. And on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again in the glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us stand aright, let us stand with fear, let us attend, that we may offer the holy oblation in peace.
judgment seat of Christ, let us ask of the Lord. Yes, o Lord. Having asked for the unity of the faith and the communion of the Holy Spirit, let us commend ourselves and each other in all our life unto Christ our God. Yes, o Lord. And make us worthy, O Master, that with boldness and without condemnation we may dare to call upon thee, the heavenly God, as Father. And to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Peace be to all. According to the individual need of each, travel those that journey by land, by sea, and by air, heal the sick without position of our souls and bodies. Through the grace, compassion, and love of man, of thine only begotten Son, with whom thou art blessed together, thy own holy, good, and life giving Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages.
our visitors this morning and friends of, of other faiths and, and so on, uh, you're, you will receive a blessed bread, but not the Holy Communion. The communion in the Orthodox churches for the practicing Orthodox Christians who have prepared themselves this morning. Honor and 
Let the pure God in the faith and love draw near.
forever and unto the ages of ages. Glory to you, Christ, our whole glory to thee. God, in the prayers of his most pure mother, the holy glorious praise for the apostles of our holy and God-bearing fathers, of our father, of the holy glorious praise for the apostles, of our father among the saints, Nicholas, Archbishop of Myron, Lycia, the wonder worker, of the holy archdeacon, Romanus the Melodist, of the holy and righteous forbearance of God, Joachim and Anne, and of all the saints, have mercy on us and save us. For he is good and lovest man. At this time, we will say the prayers of thanksgiving for having received Holy Communion, and then we'll have the bearish of the cross and the um, reading of the new nun. I'll explain that in a moment. We're just going to read the prayers. You may sit down if you like. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, our God. Glory to thee, our God. I thank thee for thou hast permitted me the unworthy to commune with thy most pure and heavenly gifts. But, O Master, who lovest mankind, who for our sakes did die and rise again, and gave us thus these awesome and life creating mysteries for the good and salvation of our souls and bodies, let them be for the healing of our soul and body, <clears throat> the repelling of every adversary, the illumining of the eyes of my heart, the peace of my spiritual powers, the faith and the shame, a love unfaith. The fulfilling of wisdom, the observing of thy commandments, the receiving of thy divine grace, and the attaining of thy kingdom. Preserved by them in holiness, may I always remember thy grace and live not for myself alone, but for thee, our master and benefactor. May I pass from this life in the hope of eternal life and so attain to the everlasting rest, for the voice of those who feast is unceasing. And the gladness of those who behold the goodness of thy countenance is unending. For thou art the true desire and the ineffable joy of those who love thee, O Christ our God. And all creation sings thy praise forever. Amen. O Master Christ our God, who is the maker of all things, I thank thee for all the good things thou hast given me, especially for the communion with thy most pure and life creating mysteries. I pray thee, O gracious lover of man, preserve me under thy protection beneath the shadow of thy wings. Enable me even to my last breath to partake worthily with the pure conscience of thy holy things, for the remission of sins and unto life eternal. For thou art the bread of life, the fountain of holiness, the giver of all good. To thee we ascribe glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of the Freely thou hast given me thy body for my food, O thou who art the fire, consume me unworthy. Consume me not, O my Creator, but instead enter into my members, my veins, my heart. Consume the thorns of my transgressions, cleanse my soul, and sanctify my reasonings, make firm my knees and body, illumine my five senses, nail me to the fear of thee, always protect, guard, and keep me from soul-destroying words and deeds. Cleanse me, purify me, and adore me, give me understanding and illumination, show me to be a temple of thy one spirit, and not the home of many sins. May every evil thing, every carnal passion flee from me as from a fire, as I become thy tabernacle through communion. I offer thee as intercessors all the saints, the leaders of the bodiless host, thy forerunner, the wise apostles, and thy fair and blameless mother. Accept their prayers in thy love, O my Christ, and make me thy servant, a child of light. For thou art the only sanctification and light of our souls, O good one, and to thee, our Master and God, we ascribe glory day by day. O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, let thy holy body be my eternal life, thy precious blood my remission of sins. Let this Eucharist be my joy, health, and gladness. Make me a sinner worthy to stand on the right hand of thy glory at thine awesome second coming, through the prayers of thy most pure mother and of all the saints. The most holy lady, the Eucharist, the light of my darkened soul, my hope, my protection, my refuge, my rest, and my joy. <clears throat> I thank you for you who have permitted me, the unworthy, to be a partaker of the most pure body and precious blood of your Son. Give the light of understanding to the eyes of my heart, you that gave birth to the true light, and light of me who am deadened by sin, you that gave birth to the fountain of immortality. Have mercy on me, a loving mother of the merciful God. 
Grant me compunction and contrition of heart, humility in my thoughts, and a release from the slavery of my own reasonings. And enable me, even to my last breath, to receive the sanctification of the most pure mysteries for the healing of soul and body. Grant me tears of repentance and confession that I may glorify you all the days of my life. For you are blessed and greatly glorified forever. Amen. At this time, the final words of instruction will be read by Father Gabriel. <clears throat> and if you still have your book, if you want to follow along, but if you can listen, it's on page 18. Behold, sister, by the grace of God, you have been deemed worthy to put on the holy and angelic image, by fully renouncing the world and all its desires, by the vows which you have made before the holy altar, in the presence of the holy angels and all the saints, you have come now to serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, sister, from now on you will ever have these promises before you, day and night. For if you do not keep them clean and untarnished, may that never be, you will be asked to answer for them on the fearful day of judgment before Christ. Recognizing also whom you have denied and to whom you have bound yourself, for you have renounced darkness and put on light. As a child of light, you shall walk serving God in faith and all purity and truth, serving the sisters even as Christ himself and not as men, so that you will be a flaming light according to the word of the Lord. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Be a true follower of Christ and of all his saints in your good works, living in true obedience with all the strength of your will even until your death. Serving God day and night with all patience, humility, and gentleness, so that for you the true promise of our Lord Jesus Christ may be fulfilled, which he gave in his holy gospel, saying, Where I am, there shall my servant be also. May the all-merciful God find you worthy, Mother, to realize this promise through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be all glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit unto the ages of ages. Amen. here before we come forward to venerate uh, one of the priests will hold the cross and then uh, we'll greet the nun. <clears throat> Very nice, of course, that you were able to come uh, to witness this. It's a rare, very rare uh, occasion. Uh, first of all, we don't have very many monks and nuns uh, taking their vows, uh, so it's not happening every week. And uh, we did invite you it's often done as a kind of, it can be done, I should say, it can be done as a kind of private uh, service in the monastery, but our monastery, uh, as Father Radu explained, has that uh, openness to people hoping, uh, hoping that uh, through our welcoming to you, you will find Christ and draw closer to Christ. So that's why we invited you together today. There is a tradition, one of those traditions uh, kind of not a dogma of the church, one of those things. We say who's ever present at our tonsory will be there at the last day of the last judgment to witness how we kept our vows. So all of us gathered today when Sister Mary is brought to the throne, uh, the community will be together with me and we'll be asked how we, how we lived our life, how we kept our promises. I have to say I was tonsured many years ago, and most of the people that came for my tonsuring have already departed this life, and uh, I always think of that on my anniversary, I think of all those people who were here, and they're now in the, in the kingdom, waiting for me to come, and just like, when I get there, they're all going to be there with their little <laughs> notebooks. <laughs> so, uh, but we wish you a long life, we don't have to rush to uh, get your first seat there for her showing up, but um, it's kind of a reminder how much we affect each other, how much we're responsible for each other, because as the saying in the church goes, we're saved together, but we perish apart. So we have to stay together, support one another, and that little story, I think, is a reminder that we're all living this life together, one body. Um, so we do thank all of you for coming, and all the priests, Father, David, our Guman, our confessor, who served the rite of tonsor. Father Gabriel, who did a couple of the prayers um, here. Uh, he is a 
a kind of a spiritual child of Mother Angelina. He was chrismated in her parish, and she was his sponsor coming into orthodoxy. And um, now he's a monk, and he's already a priest, also a priest, I should say. Um, and, and all of you. So Father Roger, who gave the homily, and, and uh, so many that are grateful. Father Nicholas is here from Mother and Angelina's former parish, where she was chrismated, and he sent her here with good intentions. <laughs> uh, we'll be together at the lunch. Please do stay. Take the whole day off. If you got to call your boss to, the whole day. It takes a whole day to make a nun. <laughs> you know, nice dinner, to a nice luncheon. Um, uh, together we'll have time to talk. But what happens now? There's a formula of what you say. You don't say, oh, honey, you look so pretty. Although, <laughs> lots of people do say that, did say that to me. I was very young then. But um, it, what you have to say is, what is your name? You say that because she just got a new name an hour ago. Maybe it didn't sink in yet. You have to say, what is your name? And then she responds, and she says, says, says my name is Angelina. A sinner. She's already a sinner. Just poor thing. Just starting out. <laughs> and we say, save yourself. Save yourself and pray for us. Save yourself and pray for us. That's the formula. Her hands are full. She can't give you a hug. She's got a lit candle. So be very careful coming up here. <laughs> the hugs and kisses will. You'll have opportunity for that later. Okay. But this is a formula that we say. And. Uh, that's what we're going to do now, each of us. And then after you have your greeting here in the church, you may go to the dining room, take a seat, uh, get yourself a cup of coffee or water while we're waiting for everybody to finish, and then we'll come and have a meal. I invite the clergy, all the priests, to come first. <coughs>
our true God through the intercessions of his most pure mother, whose protection we celebrate this day, and through the intercessions of the holy, glorious, and all praised apostles of the holy and righteous ancestors of God, you have been an of all the saints. Have mercy on us and save us, for he is good and loving and grand.